Good morning. July is here. Can you believe it? Are you ready for Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas? It's right around the corner, isn't it? Time is moving fast, and we gather for worship on this first Sunday of the month, a brand new month, 4th of July holiday coming up. It's good to be together in the house of the Lord. I invite you to stand as we join together responsively in our call to worship. Psalm 15. Who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? Those who lead blameless lives and do what is right. Those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors. Those who despise flagrant sinners and honor the faithful followers of the Lord. And keep their promises to the those who lend money without charging interest and who cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent. Such people will stand firm forever. Join with me in our song medley beginning with Jesus Saves. Oh 
God, you have taught us to follow in your way and to keep your commands. You have taught us to love you and to love our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be devoted to you with our whole hearts and be united to each other with love and affection. We pray in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, for he is the one who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. I remember when I was in elementary school, and do you remember learning to count by tens? At first you learned to count one, two, three, four, five, and then you learned to count 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. I'm going to ask Ray to count by tens today as we count our attendance, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. That will sound really good there, so give it a, give it a try there. It's good to be together in the house of God, and we're thankful that others are sharing with us in worship by tuning in online. Let me remind you to fill out your Connect cards, those of you who are here. We invite you who are watching at home to connect as well, too. You can leave a comment either on our Facebook page or on the YouTube video. Let us know of your presence, and remember this is a very easy way to pass along a message, even if you're here in person. And you think to someone that God puts here on your heart, I'd like to share that worship service with them. Once it's posted this afternoon, you can pass it along to them as well. The announcements are in your worship folder, and we especially want to let you know that, yes, it's almost that time for back to school again. School starts very early in August here in Roanoke County, and um, so our school collections take place um, much earlier, and again, we are in partnership with the Henry Ford Service Center, a long-standing United Methodist mission um, down in Franklin County. And so you see the information about the supplies that will be collected and will be using um, the first four Sundays of July for us to complete this collection so that they can be delivered down to Henry Ford and share a little blessing um, with our friends down there. We've been working together for so many years. If you've never had the opportunity to go down to Henry Ford, um, it'd be great to have you join us when we go down to share the, share the school supplies. Last week we asked the question, what does it mean to love God? And we talked about the great commandment to love God with heart and soul and mind and strength. Let me see if I remember. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yeah. And then we talked about the fact that the second great commandment is of equal importance. It is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Last week we talked about what it meant to love God. Today we'll be thinking together about what it means to love our neighbor. And we're reminded that this is not just something Jesus came up with. In fact, if you flip through to Leviticus 19.18, you know what you'll find? That verse, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There were so many good scriptures to choose from, and then there's so many in the chapter that we had this week. There's so many great things to read. I hope you'll dig a little further, but I want to share a few scripture readings with you this morning on this theme of loving our neighbor as ourselves beginning with Jesus' words from Luke chapter 6, beginning with verse 27. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who asks of you. And if anyone takes away what is yours, do not ask for it back again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. Instead, love your enemies, do good, and lend expecting nothing in return. 
your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For he himself is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. And a reading from John chapter 13, the words of Jesus, verses 34 and 35. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. These are powerful words of Jesus, and I also want to share the powerful words of Paul as he wrote to the Galatians from chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. My brothers and sisters, you were chosen to be free, but don't use your freedom as an excuse to live under the power of sin. Instead, serve one another in love. The whole law is fulfilled by obeying this one command. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let me read that verse again. Galatians 5.14 The whole law is fulfilled by obeying this one command. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you say or do things that harm one another, watch out. You could end up destroying one another. So I say, live by the Holy Spirit's power. Then you will not do what your desires, controlled by sin, want you to do. Thanks be to God for the gift of his word. I want to share with you a little story about a songwriter. Her name is Carrie Ellis Breck. She was born in Vermont in 1855. She lived most of her adult life in New Jersey and in Oregon. She was a lifelong Presbyterian. She wrote over 1,400 hymns. In her words, she put it this way, I penciled verses under all conditions, over a mending basket, with a baby on my arm, and sometimes even when sweeping or washing dishes. She was sometimes known as the baby holding hymn writer. Carrie Ellis Breck actually had little formal education only what we would call elementary school. But even from childhood, she showed a talent for writing. Her health was not good, but she never quit writing. Actually, it's said that she couldn't carry a tune, but she could sure write a poem. She would write the words and let somebody else come up with the music. She may not have been a singer, or an instrumentalist, but she did love music and she loved rhythm and her words have certainly been shared by many a singer. Today in preparation for our message, we're gonna look at one of her more well-known songs. It's a good one for today's theme of loving your neighbor. When we get to about the second verse, I may break into some harmony, so you keep singing the melody. Let's join together as we sing this, one of the most famous songs of Carrie Ellis Bray. Help somebody today. Sorry, and 
scriptures are read and your word which is proclaimed may touch our hearts today, may shape us and motivate us and send us with your blessing and the power of your spirit. Amen. So I thought about that song, help somebody today, find a neighborly need today. I, I thought about the old activities of the Cub Scouts, do you remember, or the Boy Scouts who were asked to do a good turn every day? I think that meant good deed. That's an old-fashioned phrase, isn't it? Do a good turn every day. I heard about a scout group one time, and the kids were supposed to come back and talk about their good deeds. And they went around the circle and were talking about um, the good deeds that they did the day before. And one little boy said, well, four of us helped this little lady across the street. And the scoutmaster said, well, that's, that's wonderful. Why did it take four of you to get her across the street? And they said, well, she didn't want to go. Make, make sure your good deed is one that's actually, actually appreciated there. Last week, love God with heart, with soul, with mind, with strength. And this week, love your neighbor as yourself. The two great commandments. No commandment is greater than these. This week, I read so much about loving neighbor. There were so many points of direction, so many connections to our lives, so many great Bible verses, I couldn't narrow it down to one, and there's so many more we couldn't even talk about. We talked about Galatians, but also in the book of Romans, Paul again lifts up his point. Romans 13, 9, the commandments are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you remember from high school or if you went to college years, um, you would go through a, a plan of all the courses you'd have to take, and you'd have to take required courses, and then there were elective courses. Required courses were the ones <clears throat> that you really had to have for graduation, and then there were the electives. I love electives because it gave me a choice. But if you think about it, loving your neighbor as yourself is not an elective. It's not a little extra that you do if you have time. Jesus and Paul and even the Old Testament make it so clear this is part and parcel of who we are. It's not something we do for extra credit. Love for neighbor is at the heart of who we are as followers of Jesus. I don't know if you read your chapter from Brian McLaurin this week. If you haven't yet done so, do so this week. There's one sentence we, he began the chapter with that's so powerful. Where the Spirit is moving, love for God always, always, always overflows in love for neighbor. I think Brian wanted to make sure we got the point because he said always, always, always. Love for God always, always, always overflows into love for neighbor. Jesus made it clear when someone asked the question, what's number one? He says, I'm going to give you two. Love God, love neighbor. You can't chop them in half. You can't have one without the other. There's a long list of examples from the New Testament of what we call one another ministry. I remember when I first saw the list in my studies as a pastor of all the times in the New Testament that we see the phrase, one another. Yes, we're familiar with the verse, love one another. But there's so many more. We could spend all day talking about them. What else does the Bible say? It's not just love one another. It's accept one another, serve one another, honor one another, encourage one another, be kind to one another, bear with one another. We need that one, don't we? Have concern for one another. Be compassionate to one another. Teach one another. And one that's a little more difficult, admonish one another. This is the job description of the body of Christ. It's one another ministry. It's a crystal clear picture of what it means to be God's people for one another. So often in our culture, we think about our relationship with God as a very personal thing. You don't like to probe too much. You sort of respect people's privacy. What is it they say, don't talk about religion and politics? I guess that's why we talk about sports and the weather. 
That's a little bit safer there. Well, is religion a personal, personal matter? Well, yes and no. Yes and no. It's not just between someone and God. Because true religion always connects beyond ourselves to others. The Bible paints a detailed picture of how our relationship with God must involve other people. Not, not long ago, I stumbled upon something online, and it was, it was a, a church's report that had, for some reason, been posted on their website about all the good things and bad things that were going on in their church. Well, I'm nosy enough, I just kept on reading, because I knew the church involved, and I knew the people involved, and it wasn't in Virginia, so just take a deep breath. Um, but in addition to all of the things going on, it mentioned that there were quite a few people in this church, it has about 900 members, quite a few people in this church who were dissatisfied because the senior pastor was not giving them personal attention. I know you find that hard to believe. This church had once had two pastors, and it was the associate pastor's job to do make a lot of those contacts there. Well, they had gone from two pastors to one pastor, and now this senior pastor, um, people got the feedback, the leaders of the church got the feedback, we just kind of grumbling, you know, nobody's tending to us there. And one of, there was one line in the little report that said, and people do not want other folks from the church reaching out to them in place of the pastor. They want the real deal, I guess. Well, think about that, a 900 member church, and there's a little rumbling around there. Well, I, I, I actually blame pastors for part of that problem because some of us sometimes get a little hero complex. And when somebody tells us, oh, nobody can help me like you can, preacher, you know, we usually say, oh, no, 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 no. But inside we're saying, ooh, I'm really something, aren't I? You know, so we kind of build ourselves up as heroes there. But it can lead to a problem. And I wasn't surprised to find out a year later that pastor had moved. The rumbling and the grumbling got to that pastor. The problem with this is that it represents a pretty sad misunderstanding of the biblical model of pastor. We actually don't see the word pastor all that much in the Bible. But in Ephesians, we do see it, and we actually see it defined. The role of the pastor to equip God's people for the work of ministry. You hear that? Not to be the hero, not to be the, the sole practitioner who has a little black bag, sort of like a traveling doctor, and is always there. And if we stop and think about it, think about the Apostle Paul and think about the early Methodist circuit riders. They couldn't always be there. They had to develop something that would last even when they went down the road. The same is true for us today. Imagine if the CEO of an automobile company was the best automobile builder in the world. And this particular CEO decided, I'm going to hand build every automobile that our company is going to sell. Well, this company over time would be known for two things, outstanding automobiles and a very tiny supply because that one person could only do so much. You aren't gonna be building very many automobiles if it all flows through you. Contrast that to the one another ministry description that we see in the Bible, where we're all equipped to discover our spiritual gifts and then use them to build each other up. Sort of like an athletic team. Sometimes you'll see a, a pro team in some sport that has a prima donna superstar, but the team does not do very well. That one player may set some individual records, but the team languishes because they're not working together. 
and it always inspires my heart to see a scrappy team without any famous players come together and take down that prima donna. The Bible tells the story of Moses one time, and as he was, had so much wisdom, people were lined up as far as the eye could see to come to Moses for some judgments and advice. And Moses' father-in-law, who had the Beverly Hillbillies name of Jethro, isn't that cute? Jethro kind of looked at that and said to Moses, what you were doing is not good. Jethro didn't mince any words. Well, I know men don't very often take advice from their father-in-law, but in this case, Moses did. Jethro told Moses, you need a team. You need to divide this up. You need to train some people so that there are a lot of folks that people can come to when they have needs. And you'll be there for the big ones that maybe need your intervention, but people's needs will be addressed. All roads will no longer go through you. And Moses did just that. One another ministry defines our life together. As I look over this church family, and I think about people that maybe we've lost in the last nine years. I think about people who stood out in terms of finding their calling. They didn't do everything, but they found their calling in one another ministry. Loving one another defines our life together as Christians. As we think about what the Bible says about love, we're also reminded that loving your neighbor doesn't just mean loving your fellow church member. It may start there. But it doesn't stop there. The Bible makes it crystal clear from cover to cover that love for neighbor is not just us, it's also them. It's not an inside thing. It's intended to overflow. Now when we think of neighbor, we think of the person next door, next door neighbor. But the biblical model of neighbor very clearly also means the person who is quite different from you. Do you remember Luke's version of this Bible verse, love your neighbor as yourself? In Luke's version, and Luke's version alone, what Jesus said is followed up by a question. Do you remember what the questioner said? The questioner said, who is my neighbor? And how did Jesus respond? Jesus responded with a story, a parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan, one who reached out in compassion, who was completely different in background and values from the person he reached out to, but who showed what being a neighbor was all about. Now, I, I just have to say, I'm so blessed to be a part of a church family. We may not be big in number, but we are big in impact, and we keep this going front and center. Instead of sitting around and whining about what we can't do, instead, we find something we can do. If you notice this week's slideshow as you came in, it showed food going to the local fire stations. This hadn't happened just once. It's happened repeatedly. That's loving your neighbor. We had food go to the camp counselors down at Altamont's to help prepare them for the week. That's love in action. Eight days ago, we had love in the form of gasoline going into vehicles, and we heard some wonderful stories about people who were blessed. By the way, we intentionally, how do I say this? You know, sometimes churches and charitable organizations do a good job of reaching out to people who are at the end of their rope, who have no place to lay their head, or who have an empty pantry. One of the things about the gasoline outreach is that it also blessed people who didn't really need it. Because sometimes people who need the Lord the most maybe are a little bit cynical. And so we insisted to those folks. Let us share you with some gasoline. I'll tell you what we told them. We told them, we have to stay here and we, until we give out so much gasoline, so help us because we want to go home. So we kind of flipped it around and said, just let, help us out. Let us, let us give you that gasoline. And, and it kind of surprised them. Kind of surprised them. We were surprised that we got attention from Channel 7, from a TV station in Harrisonburg, from the 
um, our district office who helped spread the word on their Facebook page, from the Virginia Annual Conference who lifted it up, from the United Methodist News Service, okay? Um, if the Today Show calls, Kim and I will be heading to New York at the drop of a hat to do our interview. We'll be glad, glad to do that. Not for the attention, but just because we live in a world that needs a little encouragement, doesn't it? It needs a little good news. It needs a little less suspicion and greed and just a little more kindness. Won't be long, we'll be taking those school supplies down to Henry Fork. Once again, being a blessing, sharing a blessing. Loving neighbor is not just loving us, it's letting that love overflow, and as Jesus painfully reminded us, even loving our enemies. And it's not just enemies, I'm just reminded that there are sometimes people that are hard to love. You know what I mean? It's wonderful when you do something kind for someone, and they have a tear in their eye, and then give you a thank you note later. It's another thing when you go out of your way to do something nice and you kind of get a There's a lot of reasons why someone might be hard to love. I thought about that last night as I was watching a television show. Now, I must confess, this is an old television show about a, a family deeply entrenched in organized crime. It is not good-hearted entertainment. There's a lot of violence and a lot of corruption there. But I actually found an interesting example because in the show we watched last night, it's years old, um, this, this particular mob family, their oldest daughter, who's a very nice and sweet girl, they've just graduated from high school and gone off to college, and she got stuck with a college roommate who was a very needy girl. She's one of those girls that if, if it had been you and you had had to spend time with her, um, within about 10 minutes, you'd be looking for somewhere to go because she, she would just drain on you, and she had no limits. And it was interesting how the character and her boyfriend tried to reach out to her, but then things kind of backfired, and something would always go wrong, and they eventually had to call their distance. If I'd been advising that character, what do you do? When someone's so hard to love, would you tell her to apply for a change in roommate? I don't know. Maybe she's there for a reason. Maybe it would come to that. I think I would tell her, decide what you can do, but don't be afraid to draw a line. Don't be afraid to say, here's what I can do. Here's what I can't do. Some people will guilt you into doing a lot more than you ever intended to do. Yes, Jesus said turn the other cheek, you know, but we have either two or four, depending on which cheeks you're counting, you know. We can only turn so long, you know, and maybe, maybe there are times when this is what I can do. I won't give up on you, but in order for me to be a blessing. You have somebody that ever called you way too late? You saw that caller ID and you said, what's the Christian thing to do? Pick up the phone or let them leave a message. Well, sometimes you have to let them leave a message. Sometimes you have to let them leave a message. There are folks who will test your patience and you need, between you and God, to figure out the way you can show love without running out, without running dry. I encourage you in that. The early Christians were sometimes looked upon by others, and people would say, look how they love each other. Do people still do that? Sometimes I think so, but in our day or time, at our day and time, if you ask someone with no church experience, what do you know about Christians? Maybe they're going to say, oh, they really are such loving people, but maybe one of the top complaints that you hear from outsiders about Christians is this. They are so judgmental. Now, as I look around at Mount Pleasant United Methodist Church, I think, I think our judgmental quotient is pretty low. I'm blessed by you, and I see you blessing others. But as I look around at our world, and as I look around at the image of organized religion, I 
do see a lot of harsh judgmentalism that clearly does not reflect the spirit of Jesus. I can see why people might say, church folks, judgmental. You know what an ambassador is, right? If there's a U.S. ambassador, say to Ireland, that ambassador represents the United States, but functions in Ireland. The Bible says that we are ambassadors for Jesus. When we come together, we gain strength and encouragement, and we are trained, and then we're sent out to be ambassadors, to bring Jesus to tough situations. Now more than ever, we need those two great commandments. Love God, heart and soul and mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. A famous song was written in 1966, and it was written by a priest named Father Peter Schultes. He was working with a youth choir in a basement in a parish in Chicago. They were planning some gatherings that would bring together not just his Catholic church, but folks from other churches, folks from different cultural and racial groups. And he was looking for a song that was appropriate for that occasion, and he just couldn't find anything. Well, unlike Cary Breck, Father Schultes was not a songwriter, but he finally decided, today I'm going to be. And he came up and wrote a song. Because of the time in which it was written, it became a defining song of my teenage years, going to church camp, going to campus ministry. And it still speaks so clearly what we're called to be about. I invite you to join in our reflection song. Y'all know we are Christian. <laughs> Thank you. 
I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care. Headed who knows where. On they go through private pain. Living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries Only Jesus hears People need the Lord People need the Lord At the end of broken dreams He's the open door People need the Lord People need the Lord When will we realize People need the Lord. We are called to take his light to a world where wrong seems right. What could be too great a cost for sharing life with one who's lost? Through his love our hearts can feel all the grief they bear. They must hear the words of life only we can share people need the Lord people need the Lord at the end of broken dreams He's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize that we must give? Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, everybody knows in our land that tomorrow's Independence Day, but our church is special because we also know it's not just Independence Day, right? It's happy birthday to Hope on July 4th, the mother of our country, right? So, <laughs> amen, happy birthday. I think she told me she's 49 tomorrow, if I, if, I got, if I got that close, I'm not sure. And so we've got to sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Hope. Happy birthday to you. And we are going to close with uh, uh, a little bit of a nod to our Independence Day. And I hope tomorrow will be a day, not just a fun and festivity, but a, a truly spiritual day as you give thanks for the blessings of life and liberty and independence. Let's join together in this prayer. Almighty God, you rule all the peoples of the earth. Inspire the minds of all women and men to whom you have committed the responsibility of government and leadership in the nations of the world. Give to them the vision of truth and justice, that by their counsel all nations and peoples may work together. Give to the people of our country zeal for justice and strength of forbearance, that we may use our liberty in accordance with your gracious will. Forgive our shortcomings as a nation. Purify our hearts to see and love the truth. We pray all these things through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand for our closing song.